So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jim, and I'm, he's going to explain how it is that we get to hear a revised version of a talk he gave earlier in the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the talk that Nancy is referring to is for CSUN, and CSUN, CSUN stands for California State University of Northridge, and the conference is the CSUN Conference on Assistive Technology. It happens every year in Southern California. Uh, last year it was in Anaheim. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful event. Many companies like Level Access go there. Um, and many people with any connection to accessibility and disability community will be there um, to explore assistive technology and to look at the issues that surround this. So let me explain. My name is Jim Griesemer. I'm a senior accessibility consultant for Level Access. And Level Access is a company that evaluates, we actually audit websites and applications for accessibility. Uh, that includes audit auditing them at the code level, doing automated testing, auditing for the workflows to see how those play out. Um, we also evaluate wireframes, and we've recently been doing usability testing and uh, training as well. And I just got involved with usability testing myself uh, with uh, users with disabilities, various levels of disability. So, um, Without further ado, I'd like to go into the talk, and I'm going to introduce you to some people. A 23-year-old female art student, art and design student, a young man from Claremont, California, a 30-year-old male sports enthusiast, a female graduate student from Ohio, a 28-year-old male model and winner of Dancing with the Stars. Anybody know him? Yeah. A 67-year-old woman from Florida. A 28-year-old woman from the United Kingdom. Those seven people and 14 more collaged here are all representative of hundreds of people from different nationalities, races, creeds, who all share one thing in common. That was um, in 2017, on Twitter, they put pictures of themselves out with the hashtag, invisibly disabled looks like. And it was picked up by Paul Harrison of the BBC News Service, and you can see the article here, um, that it was a feature story in the BBC News of that year. So why did they do this? Well, they represent millions of, uh, millions of people who chose, who chose not to share, but they did share because they felt like they needed to have people understand that you could not just look at somebody and understand whether or not they are abled or disabled. One woman preferred to, um, she's, one woman was more concerned about her sexual preference than she was about uh, divulging her disability. That's how much of a stigma there is. So what does this mean? It means that you can't make assumptions about people's ability based on appearance, but it also means that you can't expect them to divulge that information. And so we have this term that we use called disabled and enabled. And the definition, the prefix for dis is apart, asunder, away. It has a negative connotation to it. And n, meaning within or in, has a positive connotation. It's unfortunate that this is the way we're looking at this because it's not really binary. If you look at the data or work closely with assistive technology, you'll understand that it really is a continuum. So I'm going to ask you if you can imagine a disability as a continuum, and on one end, how would you draw that? 
How would you draw that in the air? How would you draw that continuum? Somebody draw it for me. I'm seeing arcs. I'm seeing arcs this way. So most people, when they do this, they tend to see it like this. You're either not or very, and everything in between. So if we think about autism as one of the disabilities, and it is one of the disabilities, you might be tempted to think of it as not or very. But in reality, it's much more complicated than that. So instead of looking at this linearly, let's look at it, all the aspects of what we're talking about with autism. Executive function, the ability to control cognitive inhibition, mem working memory, and cognitive flexibility. Sensory filter, how the brain filters out um, irrelevant data, unnecessary stimuli. Perception, awareness of location. And I'm putting this into the framework of an interface. Changes in status. Language, vocabulary, idioms, expressions, and terminology. And motor, eye-hand eye coordination, everything that you would need to do physically to interact with a website. So when we see people with autism, they may wind up with different levels of ability in each of those areas. Perception could be very high for somebody, and language fairly high. But sensory filter could be very low, as well as motor skills. And then somebody else might have something very different better motor skills, lower language skills, and someone else whoops, might have something entirely different from that. So yes, it is a continuum, but it's not necessarily a linear continuum. And I'll put that into perspective in another common disability, and that is low vision. Do any of you know what low vision is? A couple of you do. So we tend to think about visual, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> We tend to think about visual as either people can see or they can't see. But there actually is an entire range of how people perceive things visually, and low vision falls into that category. We just did a usability test with low vision users. We did actually more than one. And the spectrum of how people perceive things in low vision is all over the map. Some people need high contrast. Some people need to change the colors on their interface. We had three or four participants who zoomed in to the interface to 800 to 1200 percent and then had to zoom out. When they zoomed out again, it was blurry. They just saw light and dark areas. So they would do this thing of zooming out to get a sense of where everything was and then zooming in to read it, zooming out, zooming in to read it. That's how they interacted with the interface. When you're actually looking at the interface, some people didn't even do the zoom. They just stayed zoomed in. It's like take your, ha your hand up like this and look at an interface. It's like looking through a straw. That's how they deal with it. So even for a single disability like that, it can be all over the map. So now I'm going to talk about constants. One of the things that we often do in UX is we uh, look at one of the constants we use all the time is a persona. So when we're defining people, we, with personas, we, you tell me, do your personas ever change? You define them, they're always there. They sometimes change a little bit, but pretty much they stay the same. And if you're going to design a persona, you're going to write a persona up, and you're going to talk about their abilities, you have to ask the question, do their abilities change or do they stay the same? Yet this is what product teams commonly do. Personas are often uh, categorized are, are often predicated on constancy. So um, <clears throat> what about those folks the, the, that I just shared, the pictures of those people that I just shared? When you saw those photos, they were all standing. They were all looked like they were in good shape. But in many of those photos, and if you go out online and you go to Twitter and you put in that hashtag, they will have shared two of them. You'll see one photo with them looking as they did here and another photo of them, one of them in a wheelchair, or one of them in, in a hospital bed, because they have, they have to recover from an episode that they're having at that time. So for these folks, for many folks with disabilities, constancy is not something that's there. It comes and goes. 
So I'm going to do another challenge. Assume you're defining a persona. I don't know why it's kicking out. <laughs> Assume you're defining a persona. By what criteria would that person's ability change? What would make their ability change? Anybody have an answer for that? Just throw something out. What criteria? Go ahead. Could be internal or external. What kind of external forces might be in play? Okay. Anyone else? It could also be the environment they're performing the activity in. It could be low lighting at that time, or it could be other conditions that change. Okay. Magnetic fields. Magnetic fields. In what way? They're around the external body, and they're always changing. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. That the the the, the what I'm see oh, is there somebody else? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, noise, uh, overstimulation, understimulation. Uh, also, of course, physiological things. Uh, whether you've taken your your meds or not, and yes. also um, <laughs> other other physiological experiences, as well as uh, a lot of people have uh, have cycles and. Uh, uh, mood swings and, and, and other things. Yeah. Right, right. You're getting more to it. Yeah. So I, I was thinking in terms of the people themselves, what could actually change for them. There can be external stimuli, that's true. But I want to, I'm looking more at bigger categories. So circumstance is one that I think was brought up. This is, this is one of the people who shared their photo. She has a neurological condition from both of her parents. And this is what she said, palsies can last for days, weeks, months, or even one year at a time, year and a half, both of my arms, paralyzed. There's no way of knowing when it, something will come back or to the degree to which it will come back. Imagine if you have to use a computer and you're using a mouse and you're used to using it, and now for a year and a half you can't do it. And then it comes back. So this is not constancy. This is a change that happens. Time is another one. Uh, I love this quote. <clears throat> Disabilities are an integral part of the human experience. Every person, if they live long enough, will experience it. What somebody who is non-disabled would call a disability, I would call a normal biological variation. We all grow old, get arthritis and age spots, and lose our hearing, lose our eyesight, maybe break our hips, and have to use wheelchairs. Now, that sounds a little drastic at the end. But you know, I can tell you, I live in a senior community, and that does happen. So definitely, time will change people's level of ability. And think of it as, a, as the continuum from ability to disability. So speaking of age, Here's age. So this is a slide from the 2015 US Census Bureau. And what you're seeing here is levels of various disability, vision, hearing, cognitive, ambulatory, and different age categories, different cohorts, 5 to 17, 18 to 34, 35 to 64, and you, so on. You can see it. And look at the spike that happens at 64, 65 to 74. Now, it looks like it's dropping down, but that's the bell curve. That's mortality. That's mortality. That's the bell curve. So for those folks who are 75 and older, that's really a high percentage. There is no question that disability increases with age. So bear that stat in mind and look at this one. This is adoption of the internet by age. And these lines, this is from 2000, 2014. Look at the line for 65 and older. People who are seniors are going online. Why? Because they have no choice. You have to bank online. You have to travel online. You have to do everything online. If you don't do it online, 
it's much more complicated because companies obviously and organizations are obviously going online. And they want to go online because that's where their kids are. That's where their grandkids are. Now take that stat plus the previous one and look at this. Here's the demographic. This is the worldwide. This is from the World Health Organization, I believe. Yes, United Nations. Oh, United Nations. So here you see the, the population curves for under 5 and 65 and older. And look where we are now. Coming to 2020, we're right at the crossover point. By the year 2050, it's estimated to be 16% um, of the population. This is a report that was released. When was this out? August 16, 2018. Now, I, I constantly hear, so how many people are we talking about? Whenever I'm dealing with product, uh, products and designers and developers, but mostly the product people say, well, what are we talking about here, 5%? So I feel like I'm being pushed into giving them a percentage. Well, here's some percentages. One in four U.S. adults live with a disability. That's 61 million Americans. Most common is mobility. Notice that blindness is not there, it's mobility. Over 65, it, disability affects two in five people. This stat was referenced in this article that came out just a few days ago in the New York Times. And what he's referring to is banking applications and investment applications. So now when you're doing banking and investment, you have to do it online. They're all doing this. This is a, so this is, so yes, and look at this quote. Despite the passage of the ADA, lawsuits and heightened awareness and the needs of the disabled obstacles to investing present obstacles to investing in money management persist for people with disabilities. The fix, and this line, the fix often requires reverse engineering software procedures, which can be costly and time consuming. There are signs that some financial services company are rethinking their approach to accessibility, but customers remain concerned. I am taking issue with that middle sentence. This fiction, this fix often requires reverse engineering. That happens because we're waiting to deal with it. <clears throat> so to look at this so far, you have an overwhelming number of variables to contend with if you're going to try and define who your target audience is in terms of accessibility. And to unless but and so nonetheless you still have to take into account because you cannot accurately determine the percentage of disabilities. So it's better to just take it into account from the beginning. And to not do so is to exclude people who are your users of your application. And to not do so puts your organization at risk for increasing not only at risk for a lawsuit, but increasing development costs. So that's what I'm going to speak to next. The common statement that I hear with accessibility is that it's too expensive because it takes too much work to fix it. Well, there is a formula for this. This is a formula that was put out by Leviathan Levi and Chang, and it reads, a defect caught in requirement space costs a factor of one to one to fix. That means that you've already prevented the issue from happening, so there's no additional cost. It's the cost of the development itself. A defect caught in construction, and we can put that in terms of design, costs 10 times as much to fix as in requirements. If you have to re redesign it, that's going to cost more money. If you wait until it's developed, it's 100 times more expensive. So when, when you're hearing product talk about it's too costly, this is why. It's because accessibility is being shifted to the back end of the development cycle 
usually with UAT, the user acceptance text, testing. Sometimes it's there in QA, but I see a lot less of it than should be there. The solution is to shift accessibility left. I'm actually wearing those pins right now. Um, so that means that the teams, the developers, and the designers need to understand what accessibility is. The developers need to be trained in how to make applications accessible. And it's out there. The W3C has all of this information out there and how to do it. You need to ensure that content and authoring teams understand the impact of content to accessibility. I'm going to show an example of that later. With many companies, con content, authoring, is separated out from design, and that's separated out from development. And there's an impact to them not communicating. Make accessibility an application requirement. If you make accessibility a requirement from the beginning, you're going to mitigate these issues from being, becoming expensive. So that means we need to avoid silos. I was working at a company where I was working with the design, with the development team directly, and we were trying to solve a particular issue with a form, and we figured it out, we solved it. But because this development team was just one development team of two other development teams for that single feature on the uh, application, I knew that the other development team would have to solve that same issue. So I said to them, well, can we tell them what to do? And they said, no, we can't. And I assume they didn't mean that they didn't have the capacity to do it. They could have spoken if they wanted to. They were not permitted. So silos are really deadly. We're not going to solve these issues if you have silos. Accessibility requirements should be in the functional requirements for every component and included in the acceptance criteria. So the most common ones that we see are keyboard. Everything has to be navigable by the keyboard. Images need to have alternative text. Images and icons need to have alternative text. Uh, there's special cases if the icons are next to text that shouldn't. Um, and then forms are a big issue. Forms need to be coded correctly and designed correctly as well. Design patterns should include accessibility acceptance criteria. But beware that when you start with a design pattern, even if you make it accessible, you still have to deal with integration. The design pattern's almost like a Lego block. It's a component. If you just take these Lego blocks and put them together, you're not necessarily going to have an accessible application any more than if you have accessible pages that you put together in a workflow. That doesn't necessarily make it accessible either. All of this has to be tested with integration because when it comes down to using the application, the experience of the person with a disability is through the workflow, page to page, piece by piece by piece. Testing must include accessibility testing and more than just a quick cursory test. How many of you done any accessibility testing? Well, I know Nancy has. What have you done? Have you, I mean, you, let me put this, well, maybe we don't have to answer. No, let's do it. What have you done? What specifically have you done with a test? Curious to know. tabbed through the page to see that every like interactive element on the page actually like um, can be accessed in order okay. to a hierarchy. And when you're doing that, did you check to see if they were visible? Oh, if they, because sometimes when if the page changes depending on the size. No. That's what I usually pay for. If you're tabbing from one element an element, how do you know that you, the focus is on that element? Supposed to have an outline around it. Yes. 
a box. And a lot of the times those boxes are suppressed. So tabbing is certainly is one of the tests you would do. But that's not the only test. Because with a screen reader, while they tab, they also use the arrows keys. They go up and down. Anyone else? What else do you test? Any, anything else beyond that? Anybody test with the screen reader? VoiceOver? Have you tried JAWS? Uh -huh. Have you tried NVDA? No. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. See, there's so many more things to learn and know and have fun with. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that, jo that VoiceOver is good. It's glad that it's, I'm glad that it's there with the Mac. And most of the teams that I've encountered doing uh, accessibility testing, that's what they're using, is VoiceOver and the Mac. And most of the time, what I see them doing is just tabbing. Tab, 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 listen, tab, listen, tab, listen. That's not enough. You have to be going up and down the virtual cursor. You have to be using uh, the interact, and interact with the dialogues, with the applications, with the forms. And you really should be testing on JAWS and an NDDA because there's a larger percentage of users who use screen readers that use that environment than on the Mac. Now, it's very different on the iPhone. That's the other thing. Have you tested on this? Has anybody tested on this? No? This comes with, a, with voiceover. So yes, testing has, that's what I would call a quick tertiary test. The, the QA teams need to, de, need to do more than that. They need to go into the screen readers. They need to look at the code. They need to do automated tests, which only catch about 30, 35%. Content and design must be stable from the beginning and coordinated with design and development. And here's an example. Now, this is not from my personal experience, but it's relevant. This is Viking. And Viking has these ships, these classes of ships. And you can see, I'm going to make it scroll here. See at the bottom of each of those containers is learn more. This is a common device in design, learn more, read more. Those learn mores, is, in many contexts, become confusing for screen reader users because if they were to tab through it, they would only hear learn more, learn more, learn more. However, Viking did a good job. They put in ARIA, although they used ARIA label. I wish they would have used something else. Um, and their learn mores actually read off what these, what these categories are. But let's say that this organization, like others, the development team and the design team came up with these separately. And now there's the content team. And I've had experiences where the content team, where you, so I look at something like this, I say, oh, I see the learn more links. I'm going to advise you to use ARIA to make them specific. Meanwhile, the content team makes the decision to make those links specific in real text. So now you have duplication. You have text that gives the context as well as a system text that gives the context again. And now it becomes, ARIA actually becomes a hindrance rather than a help because the, the development team did not know that content was going to change those learn more links and make them specific. If it does say learn more about the Asia class, learn more about Ukraine, learn more about Egypt, you don't need to put ARIA here because the link says it all. So that's an example where you have to have communication between the content team, the development team, and the design team to know what to do to make this application accessible. Does that make sense? Yes. Could you clarify what ARIA is? ARIA stands for accessible rich, access, yeah, access, accessible rich internet application. Yeah, I always flub that one. So when the W3C came up with all of the criteria for making applications accessible, like the standard attributes that go into forms, this was pretty much before we had rich internet applications. So the widgets that do things on the same page, that uh, make things change dynamically, 
ARIA was written, ARIA is a series of attributes that gets put into the HTML that helps assistive technology, mostly screen readers, to understand and communicate what's to, this, to the screen reader user what's going on. So if you have something that pops a dialog, ARIA will let them know that this link is going to pop a dialog. Why? Because then they won't expect it to go to another page. They'll know they're still on the same page, but a dialog is open. ARIA will help them with a, uh, an accordion to let them know that when they click on this button, and it, it's expanding something, because it says expand it. ARIA does that for you. ARIA also does things like if you have an image, like an icon, that's next to a text, and that text stands for that icon, you don't want the, the icon to say the label and the label. That's saying it twice. So you have something called ARIA hidden equals true, if it's an icon. Or if it's an image, you use an alternative text that with a null value. But ARIA is used to make these um, rich internet applications more accessible. But there is a caveat. And that caveat is, if you can do it without using ARIA, don't use ARIA. In other words, if there's a semantic solution, do that first. Because ARIA can get you in trouble. But this is an example where if we didn't have, if, if you only have Learn More, having ARIA in place is very helpful. So I can use ARIA with an attribute on this link that re refers to the, the head there that says Asia. Or it says even more, learn more about Asia class or learn more about Asia excursions. And that makes it specific to, to those contexts. <sighs> Excuse me. Oh, that's why this is here. Is that, that must be happening because I'm hitting this. OK. All right, so but this is great. <sighs> but is it enough? I say no. I think we need to shift it even further left. So now we're talking about design. What about design? Well, I started in UX, and I remember working in design. We tend to have a belief that we can design almost anything, and the engineers will come up with a solution for it. They'll be able to make it work. But there are, there are implications to what we're designing. So the questions that we should be asking ourselves as designers, first of all, does the, does the design require visual perception of the entire page to be understood? Look at it and ask yourself, if I couldn't see this, could I understand it? And I don't mean could you hear it. I mean if you could look at it, see the words, hear the words, as a screen reader would do it. Would you be able to understand it? Or is there something about that design that's making the context clear? Does it require visual perception of the layout to be understood? Does it require any single sensory perception, including memory, to be used? So examples. This is a form I've seen more than once. It is used usually to find some type of a provider, most often a healthcare provider. So you have this dependency on the form. Use my location, or use zip code or radius with a radius, or use the city and state. Now, who wants to tell me why or is so big here? And I've seen this more than once. Why is or so big? Yes. Say it out loud. Most people will fill out the whole thing. Most people will fill out the whole thing because they have a tendency to go for each of the fields and just fill it out. You encounter a form, you say, I want to get it filled out. So they made the or real big. So it will stand out. But guess what? A screen reader user, when they encounter this, when they hear use my location as a, as a checkbox, they know it's a form, they're going to start tabbing. Most screen reader users tab. Are they ever going to hear the or? No. So they are going to fill it out. And they will think they're doing the right thing. Because chances are they're not going to use the virtual cursor and go down and hear the OR. And even if you were to use ARIA with this, 
How would you make that clear? That's not easy to make clear. You're going to put or, or use my location, or zip, it, you, you can't. Because when you tab from field to field, it has to announce the label of the field. So this is a design that's predicated on visual perception. In order to understand how to fill this form out, you have to be able to perceive the or, the ors, in the context of the fields so that you know that you have to make a choice. There are other ways to do this. You could have people choose one of those methods first and then give them the field. This is another one. We're actually starting a library that we call Unusual Beasts. This is what I refer to as a radio button sandwich. So if you click on any of these radio buttons, a form is revealed in between the radio buttons. So there's a dependency. There's a visual dependency there. You know that if you click on Hulu, all of this stuff that's applicable to Hulu opens up. If you click on Amazon, Hulu closes, and now the form that's applicable to Amazon Video opens up. And chances are you're going to see very similar fields. Certainly last name, first name, last name, email address will be there on all of them. So it's going to sound the same. The question is, what is this experience like for a screen reader user? Is there a cognitive hit to this? For a, a user with cognitive disabilities, is there a hit to this? For a user with low vision who's zoomed way into this stuff, and they're in the middle of this expanded form, do they know which form that they're looking at? Again, the straw. Which one are you on? There's a hit to doing this where if you had all of these radio buttons condensed at the top, choose one and have the rest of the form at the bottom, you're actually not losing any space, but you're creating more clarity, certainly for, peop for people who use assistive technology. The funny thing is about this, and I've been presented this more than once, is, is I've been told, well, this is out in the wild. It's everywhere. I haven't found an example of it yet. Does anybody know of one? Of the nesting? Yes. Where is this form? Does anybody know of a place out here that uses this? I haven't seen it. And when I see it, I plan to test it. OK, now we get to memory. So Nielsen's. I think fourth heuristic, recognition, not recall. This is my 1999 Toyota Camry. And in it, I have to use a key to open the door. I have to use a key to turn on the ignition. And then I have to manually pull a handbrake, right? This is the 2018 Toyota Camry. I do not need to use a key. I just pull the door. All I have to do is have this fob on me. Obviously, I can't put a key in that thing. It has a push button. And then this brake, I never pull because it does it automatically. Now, I use both of these cars every week. And every week, sooner or later, I try to put my key into that button. Or, or I try to pull that handle and it, it doesn't open. And while that's an annoyance, what worries me is the handbrake. <laughs> if I get used to using the, not having to pull the handbrake, what happens when I don't pull that thing? This is memory. And this is, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who has memory issues. And yet this happens to me consistently. There is lots of data out there that tells you that when, you're, when you are uh, trying to get anything as a habit, you have to do it a certain amount of times consistently before it really sticks and actually becomes part of what we often refer to as muscle memory. It's there. You don't have to think about it. But if you're constantly shifting back and forth from one to the other, you're never going to get there. And that's what's happening to me. And I'm sure it happens to other people. It certainly happens to people with cognitive disabilities. We had a, a participant just last week with a cognitive disability who when we asked her to do instructions in the usability test, 
she said, let me, allow me to write them down. So she, what she did was she pulled up Notepad, and she, as, as my assistant, as my colleague, was telling her what the instructions were for doing this test, her task, she wrote them down because she has to bounce back and forth between the application and Notepad. Otherwise, she'll forget the list of instructions, even if it was said to her a few minutes ago. And somewhere in the middle of the, app, of the test, a pop-up comes up. Would you like to take her a survey? And what she says is any time that happens, she loses the task that she was doing. It just goes. So for many people, these interruptions can be a problem, as well as trying to recognize what to do with these devices if they're not consistent. So here's my example. This is um, something I often heard as being called selectables. They're not pills. They are actually, the top one is a radio button. Is it true? Yes, no, maybe. It's mutually exclusive. Now these bottom ones, they're generic. They're kind of generic because that's what you would do in a wireframe. You don't know what content's going to do with it. But you could have a situation where the first one is mutually exclusive and the bottom one is multiple. You could select more than one. And the only way to tell that is by looking at the text itself, just like you're doing at the top. Yes, no, maybe is very clear. We all know that. It's mutually exclusive. But sometimes people are presented with options they don't understand when they see three words that that's mutually exclusive. It could be. It might be you can select more than one. How are you going to know if you don't have the radio button circle or the checkbox that tells you this one's mutually exclusive, this one is not? And even if you say, and I've heard this, well, they'll struggle the first time and they'll remember it the next time. Now watch, they're gonna to go to another application for the next three days that has a real form with real checkboxes, real radio buttons. They're, going, they're not gonna remember this. So this is the challenge that you're putting on people if you're trying to get them to change something that's standard and having them try to remember it the next time. We tend to design to our own biases. You know, nobody intentionally sets out to design or develop an application that's hard to use, let alone discriminatory. But you know, uh, science show tells us that we can only process about 40 pieces of information at a time. And even as designers, we can Fail to fail, you know, fall to making decisions based on our own biases, especially when we're under pressure to deliver, as we all are, with the new agile, agile methodology, and with something like MVP. So, I'm going to bring up this show. Uh, is anybody familiar with Halt and Catch Fire? It's a series. It's a series that brings up the time period between, you know, in the 19, 1980s and 1990s when the computer revolution was going on and personal computers were coming in. Um, and I think you can see Lee Pace down there. And this is a little clip which is very applicable, thank you, to what we're talking about. What was that dust up in the bullpen this afternoon? Uh, about. It's a long story. Yeah, well, I got nothing but time. Clark, huh? Gordon is good. Mm. He's really good. Uh -huh. But Gordon wants to build a computer that'll impress all the other people who build computers. I want to build something for people who never thought they'd want a computer, who don't know anything about them. I want to build a computer for you. OK, you can come up. So my question is here, who are you designing for? Who are we designing for? Who are we developing for? Who are we doing all this work for? Are we doing this for people or are we doing this for ourselves? And it's very easy to fall into doing it ourselves. I knew that as a designer. Every designer wants to get accolades. Every developer wants to get accolades. 
for, from their colleagues for what they do. But can we lose sight of who we're doing this for? And to that end, this sign came up about a month ago, I think, and started going across the internet. And I'll read it. This is a church sign. At the end of the day, I'd rather be excluded for who I include than be included for who I exclude. We are in the heart of Silicon Valley where the mission here, as I understand it, is to change the world. And inclusiveness is a very big piece of what this valley does. Trying to connect the world, as I've heard. Trying to make life better for people. Trying to include everyone. Well, this is applicable to accessibility as well. Because inclusive design, and that's what we're talking about here, inclusive design means access means removing the barriers, and access includes everyone. And now I just wanted to make another note. Level access is hiring. So what we're looking for are people to do essentially what many of us do at level, what I do at level access, which is to evaluate applications and websites for accessibility. Um, and then make recommendations as to how to fix them. We do get involved with wireframe evaluations at times. Most of the time the applications are built, they're either a prototype or they're in the, or they're in the public. We also have been doing usability testing and we've been doing training. But what we're looking for are for people to evaluate the applications. If you have knowledge of HTML, if you have uh, any sense of doing QA, of looking at these things and understanding and trying to understand what is it that's making them not work and how to fix them, that's what we're looking for. And then, any questions? And thank you, by the way. Any questions at all? Um, hi, I work at Google on voice user interfaces, and I was wondering, are you thinking about expanding some of your testing services to do testing on, on voice-enabled devices as well? Oh, absolutely. If, if Google wanted to do an evaluation of voice user interface, that would be part of it. And I'm glad you bring up VUI, because I have seen articles out on Medium on VUI where it's been lauded as the next replacement for GUI. But we have to remember that VUI is going to help some people. And if there is no alternative, remember the other sensory perception, if there is no visible uh, alternative to it, now some people who had access to it suddenly won't. So yes, we often do evaluations of all forms of audio and video. Video is an interesting challenge because you sell the closed captions. You notice that the word chuckles was there. It's not just what people are saying, but it's also things that are happening in the background that give context that's important to what the video is. So yes. What kind of um, research or work is there on accessibility challenges uh, for interlingual? Interlingual. Mm -hmm. So there's a page in English, which is the you know global language of the current time. Yes. Being. So that's an accessibility challenge for economics, also. Well, it it depends well, on the so context. That wasn't the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're asking. When you're saying interlingual, do you mean uh, between two human languages? Okay, English and Spanish, Chinese yes. and Russian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it depends on the context. Obviously, if with any any site, and this is actually one of the things we evaluate. One of the first things we look at on a website is, is the language been defined? There is a lang attribute at the very head of the, of the document that has to be there, but. You can also have the ability to change a website from English and Spanish. When that happens, that attribute has to change. And you can have the, uh, web, the website or application 
do individual components that are in a different language. Then you have to define that language attribute there, because when the screen reader encounters these things, it's going to attempt to enunciate in whatever language that it's being told to enunciate it in. So yes, that can be addressed. Nancy, you probably have other instances since you're more involved with language, too. No? Uh, yeah, the, the project I was working on most recently didn't have language uh, coverage yet at the point when I was there. But I'm, I, I was worrying more about, the, during that period of time a couple of years ago, uh, I was trying to look at how our potential clients, you know, were going to address any of the interface elements right. that we were offering them and how were they going to choose which things that they wanted to tune up or tune down if they weren't aware of how to uh, adjust things for themselves. How could we provide them with built-in stuff that was a good combination to hit the biggest number of people with mobility, dexterity, and vision issues. We weren't yet looking at all of that. Right. I'll give you another example. We recently did a usability test with a document from Canada that had French and English within the same document. And within the same little sections, there was the English version and the French version. Now, one screen reader used it had the French language file in their screen reader so it knew how to pronounce that. But another one didn't. It was all English. And it's funny when you hear screen readers attempting to enunciate French in English. And what it did was it distracted them. It distracted them because it sort of sounded like English, but it wasn't. And they're trying to interpret this thing. And every now and then, it would say words that sound like English, but they're not English. And then it would say the English word. Then it would say the other one again. And it's, it's very confusing for people. So yes, it does have to be defined. Go ahead. Anyone else? Behind you, Nancy. Um, thank you again for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, like, what are um, what are different ways that uh, different di uh, what are different ways that disabled people are involved in the development processes with projects that you've been a part of, um, like? we've been talking about them as users, but mm -hmm. um, in what ways are they considered experts? Well, I can give you examples of how they're involved with our company. So one of, our, uh, one of, one of my colleagues is Brian Garavente. And Brian wrote the specification for the W3C for ARIA. He's completely blind. But he's um, amazing what he knows. So he's there. We have many people who have low vision. And what we find is when we do use case testing, these folks are invaluable to us because they have a level of experience with using the applications that we don't have. I can tell you, um, and it's funny how I discovered this recently. Any of you use CodePen? No one? CodePen is this little site that you go on and gives you the, the HTML, the CSS, and, and the JavaScript in three columns. You can try something out. Well, I recently tested something in IE11. Well, guess what? CoPen's no longer supporting IE11. You know what happens? The screen goes blank. But it's still there. So if you start using the screen reader, you experience what it's like to listen to this thing without being able to see it. And you know what? It's a different experience. It is a different experience. Your eyes are going to fool you when you go through this thing with the screen reader. You're going to you're going to have a certain visceral level of, of recognition, yes, that works. That is beyond what you're used to. And it's, it's, it just is there. But if you don't see it, it's very different. Dave. Uh, thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Jaffe. I teach a course at Stanford called Perspectives in Assistive Technology. If any of you have an interest in that area, I invite you to sit in mm -hmm. on the uh, lectures starting in January. Um, please meet up with me afterwards so I can get your uh, email address so I can send you newsletters. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yes, sir. Oh, hi. Yeah, Mike. My name is Bob Martinengo. I just have a little bit of a devil's advocate comment because you brought up screen readers, yes, like different reacting in different ways. 
why aren't screen readers smarter? Like, why not invest? Oh, and I'll give an example. Based on Google, we know we've seen fantastic uh, types of prediction, right? Type, typing things in, mm -hmm. and it will immediately say, "Gee, you know, here's where this person is." So I'm going to bring up suggestions around them. Um, why not make the screen readers smarter? Like, why, why, why put all the burden then on the developer? Not that they shouldn't have some of it, but why not make the tools for the person with a disability a, good a lot better to interpret what they're getting? That's actually a good question, but I'll, I'll ask the same question. Why aren't the browsers better? Why aren't the browsers consistent? And if you think about the screen readers not being consistent, the browsers not being consistent, the operating systems not being consistent, boy, that creates a lot of variables, doesn't it? And yes, you're right. I have seen instances where something works on one screen reader and on the other one it doesn't. I've seen instances where the same screen reader works differently on different browsers. This is a good question. Think of it as trying to stay ahead of the curve. Obviously, the browsers are trying to keep up with this. Freedom Scientific of JAWS is trying to keep up with this. They're always releasing new versions. But you know what? Designers and developers are doing the same thing. So I recently encountered a forum. How many of you have seen Mad Lib forums? Mad Lib? What is Mad Lib like? It's, it's this forum that has fields in the middle of a string of sentence, like a sentence. So you have the sentence, it's supposed to be natural language. You're, it's asking you in text what this is supposed to be, what you're supposed to get, and here's the field. You fill in blank, you fill in the blank, you fill in the blank. And it often gives you a part of speech. So put in a verb here, put in an adjective here. Yeah. Here's the problem. Screen reader users will be tabbing from field to field because that's how they hear the labels to the field. They're not going to hear this verbiage of the, the sentence. There's no sentence structure for them. It's just fields. So are we taking into account that that works that way? And how is a screen reader going to accommodate that? That's a design change that goes beyond what screen readers were supposed to deal with. Screen readers have to work in tandem with the standards that exist on the W3C. So ARIA was one of those innovations. Obviously, the W3C saw that um, that design was coming up with interactivity that was beyond the standard HTML, so they had to come up with ARIA. That took a bit of work to do, and they're, they're constantly reworking ARIA to try and keep up with it. But yes, it's, it's this constant race. You have to keep up with what design and development is throwing at you. Development is now using frameworks. We have React, we have um, Vue, we have, uh, what are some of the other ones? Bootstrap. When you get these platforms, when you get these uh, UI frameworks, they often come with ARIA attributes in them. But those ARIA attributes are not, they're, they're kind of like placeholders, they're starting points. You have to know what to do with them. You have to change them to the context. If you have um, ARIA labels that are all identical, it's going to sound all the same to the screen reader, to the screen reader user. So, Again, development is making changes that then um, screen readers have to keep up with. I, the carousels are another great example. Carousels are ama amazing amount of work for screen readers. And what we have to do when we evaluate carousels, the nightmare. And calendar pickers, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you know how you can get away from a calendar picker? If you have a text field that has forgiving format, that means that however the user puts it in, whether they're spelling out the entire month and the day, whether they're doing the numbers with the slashes, whether they're doing the dots, however they do it, it recognizes it and puts in the date. They already do this in the UK because in the UK, phone numbers are not consistent. In the UK, you have these different splits of numbers depending on the area you're in. So you can't do what we do in the United States which is area code exchange three, number. Three, three, four. Yeah, right? Can't do that there. They have one field, however people put it in, it ignores the punctuation, ignores the spaces, looks at the numbers, and that's it. We should be doing that. You can't make a calendar picker work, hide the calendar picker, and allow them to use um, forgiving format on the field. Otherwise, go out to Brian Garavante's site and use his calendar picker because it is accessible. Anything else? Thank you. 
Oh, can you give any suggestions on how to design for uh, accessibility across cultures, whether it's dialects or values? You know, Nancy, you can actually speak to that a little bit more than me, but cross cultures, well, I think that a lot of it is going to be pretty ubiquitous other than reading order. Obviously, you're gonna have reading order changes. So in some, lang in some uh, languages, shift accessibility left would be shift accessibility right, <laughs> or shift accessibility up. But they're obvious, well, this comes down to, to, to language and idioms. And Nancy, I know you can speak to this. Well, I mean, then you have all these problems of the formats of numbers and measurements and so on, which are you know, different in the way in which we express those with the label first or the label second from the number and where there's a comma or you know, delimiters are all different. So uh, and how do you read that? And how do you get the screen reader to read that correctly in whatever language? Yeah, I don't know. There's a bunch of things to do there. Right, but I, I, it's entirely possible to, to code it so that if you have a reversal of the reading order, then the screen reader does the same thing on that reversal. Um, I think it comes down to terminology, too. We have, we, and Nielsen has this first person heuristic, I believe, is use the, use the language, natural language of people's natural language. Don't speak over their heads. Don't use terminology that's hard for them to understand. Use something that is, is, is accessible to them in terms of understanding. And that's real important for cognitive users of cognitive disabilities. They're not going to necessarily know what some of these words are. When uh, we did a recent usability test, we had a participant with severe dyslexia. And he, he encountered words that were just unfathomable to him. Like unfathomable like unfathomable. Yeah, so don't use unfathomable, use something else. We have a thesaurus, we can use it. Anything else that you would say, Nancy? This is your turn. Well, you have, you have more experience with the language this way. That's the other thing, you know, at level access, we all are trained in accessibility, we all do this. But we all recognize that each one of us has spe specializations. So my specialization is in UX, and with uh, evaluating wireframes. Brian, who wrote the specification for ARIA, is a master screen reader user. He knows screen readers like the back of his hand. He understands, he understands them completely. We have other people who are specialists in Zoom text and others who are specialists in Dragon and have specialized domain knowledges and we all collaborate and work together. This is a lot to know, but you can do it if you work together. Can you share any experiences about um, password requirements and forgotten oh. passwords? <laughs> oh my gosh. Everybody's favorite pattern. Where do we start from here? You know, and it's only gotten more complicated because I think five, six times a day I have to do two-factor authentication. I am literally carrying my phone around with me everywhere. Um, it's, it's interesting. We had another usability test, with, again, with the low vision users, and one of the things they had to deal with was um, social security numbers. And the people who were zoomed into 800, 1,200%, you know what, you could read that number from across the room. So they had concerns about that. At the same time, they wanted to be able to see what they were typing. So what did they suggest? They suggest doing what we do on our phones, which is you type the number, it's there, and then it goes to the character, the hiding character. Yes, um, I think that it would be helpful for people if they had the ability to hear the password, because most of the time, screen reader users have a headset on. They're not speaking this in public. They don't have it broadcasting out. And they have something that they're listening to by themselves or else they're doing it at home. So obviously we have these eye icons or however you're doing it to expose the password. That should be available for screen reader users as well. They should be able to hear what they're typing and check them. And error conditions are another big issue with forms and how those are handled. So that's one of the big things we looked at, looked at as well. Yes. Edwin. Uh, so as you mentioned, 
in the answer to a previous, the pre last question before yes. that, uh, it's a lot to know. Yes. As a UX designer who is interested or might be interested in learning to be able to cover more of these possibilities, to include them in his designs, what would you recommend for resources? Well, there's, there's lots of training out there. Uh, yes, his class is great. Um, but you can also go out to WebAIM, Web, A-I-M, and look at what they have there. So you, under, you just have to understand how is it that it works. The other thing to do is actually get your hands on this thing. Try out sites with a screen reader. NVDA is free. If you have a PC, you can use it. Um, so I'd like to offer you a couple other suggestions. Are you familiar with the book by Whitney uh, Quisenberry and Sarah Horton? What's the name of it? Uh, Web for All, I yes. think. And, and it, they take uh, kind of 10 prototype people with different kinds of disabilities, each of them, and describe what their, what their lived environment is and then how uh, technology, digital technology might be helping them, what aids they might have, like a screen reader or whatever. So that's helpful to get that big picture on what are some of the differences and big types. Another one is um, a book by Sean Henry called Just Ask. And she talks about you know, how to approach people with disabilities and about digital technology. So she was very much instrumental in the building of the uh, WCAG 2.0. Yeah. She was one of the staff on that. Um, and I would encourage everybody to take the pledge. I've taken the pledge, and I hope you will too, and that is I will uh, use at least one disabled person in every study I do. Yeah, and absolutely. And by the end of the year, you will have had a dozen or 15 or something, and you're starting to get a picture for yourself. They don't have to have the same disability every time, and you're never going to find two people with exactly the same vision impairment, you know? Um, but have a screen reader one time, have a colorblind person another time, have somebody with some kind of mobility issue. Right. And you can recruit to those things. And over the course of a year, if you've only had one person in each study, you will have collected a lot of ideas and raised the consciousness of your dev team too, and your design team. Right, and then just what I mentioned before, when you're designing, step back and ask those questions. Does this require visual perception to understand? You know, start from the base. Start from what is out there on WebAIM. When you're designing a form, start with a form that has labels on top, form fields, just as it is now. If you decide you're going to put the labels within the fields, then look at the complications that are around that. Form labels that are used as placeholder text are not accessible unless you go into the sliding label that moves up. And even that has some challenges. Nielsen Norman did an article on that. So start from the base and then look at what the implications are when you start dealing with custom components. All that information is out there. Oh, by the way, I have, um, a yes, I have a sheet with all my sources, if anybody's interested. That's right here. And we'll add it to the website also so that it will be available. So let's thank Jim and uh, come down and talk to him some more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.